To savour the delights of round one, I joined 2,000 faithfuls at Little Sutton Town FC near Birmingham. Billy Bremner's Doncaster Rovers were the visitors. Now, the visit of Doncaster doesn't usually cause a stir, but this was Sutton's first appearance in round one in 101 years. The crowd swelled from 300 to 2,000, but there was a worry. What's this about Bremner making a comeback? He could make monkeys out of us. It was idle gossip. Bremner had decided to stay in the manager's dugout after all. Somewhat relieved by this, Sutton's part-timers began to believe in themselves. Well, at least it was all square at the interval. Not bad, eh? It couldn't last, though. With the local lads tiring in the mud, Doncaster swooped. 1-0, and the impossible dream was well and truly dashed when Lally got number two. So, Doncaster for Wembley? Well, it certainly won't be Sutton. Again, all three big men inside the Colchester Paddy area for Yeovil. Same once more towards Green. Oh, a little big turn forward, and it's a goal by Clive Green! And Yeovil have rocked Colchester in the first 15 minutes with the goal they had planned. It came from that free kick, flighted in by Borthwick. Bell turned it on, and there was Clive Green, Yeovil's leading scorer, to slide home his 10th goal of the season and possibly set up another experience by Yeovil of giant killing. Nail-biting last few minutes for both sides. Gaines had her away. Leslie chips it back into the box. It'll break there for Bremner. Steve Wignall gets the goal that rescues Colchester just as it seemed that Yeovil had clinched another famous cup victory. And the ball was played in for the umpteenth time. Bremner climbed for it, but it ran loose, and Wignall, right-footed, kicked it high into the top of the Yeovil net. And Brian Parker can't believe it. And it looks as if Colchester have earned a replay in the last five minutes of this game. So, a replay it is, and within the hour it was inside the Colchester boardroom that both managers and their teams gathered anxiously around a radio set to listen to the draw for the third round. Number 56, Colchester United, yes. 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 Town. Number 40, against Watford. Oh. Well, there we are. A groan of uh, disapproval from all around us, but let's ask the managers what they think of the draw first. Uh, Bobby Roberts. I'll be quite happy to be playing Watford, yeah. <laughs> that means you're not terribly confident about the replay on Wednesday, then? Well, we know it'll be a hard game. As I say, if we get through, you know, it'll be very nice, but uh, we know how difficult it'll be at Yeovil. Barry, the incentive, you've got a home replay of uh, a home tie as well in the third round if you get through. Yeah, obviously, uh, at the end of the day, when you're drawn at home, uh, especially from the support point of view back home uh, on Wednesday night, um, that'll bring a few more people into our game on Wednesday and hopefully they'll support us and uh, having Watford in the next round will be really nice, nice thing. The goal which settled it for Barnsley was, to say the least, unusual. A remarkable throw-in tempted the Rotherham goalkeeper off his line. The ball came to Derek Parker, whose shot bounced in over a defender's foot. Not a classic, but enough for Barnsley to fall back and defend. They quietly led away at half-time and thus missed Sheffield United's opening goal which came as a complete surprise to everyone. The Chesterfield goalkeeper, John Turner, had been more surprised than most, letting Bob Hatton's weak shot through his hands. The game struggled on through the second half, the ball spending much of the time at the mercy of the wind. Chesterfield then began to look for the equaliser. This free kick eventually bringing one of the game's better saves from Derek Richardson. At the other end, Sheffield were making the most of some poor defensive work. With just a minute to go, Chesterfield looked finished. Then Birch made a desperate run for goal and ended up on the ground. 
John McPhail went on his knees to protest, but his prayers weren't answered. And with almost the last kick of the match, Birch kept Chesterfield in the cup. A draw was probably the best reflection of the game. The two sides will try to get a result at Chesterfield tomorrow night. After the blue, Chesterfield came out and scored. But substitute Gary Simpson's goal had been a touch lucky, his shot coming off a defender. But as this replay struck again after 17 minutes, a spectacular shot from 20 yards. But Hull City equalised in their first genuine attack seven minutes before half-time, and it was Craig Norrie who got the final touch. Within two minutes, though, Blythe were back in front. Another excellent long-range goal, this time by Ray Young. Young, a gardener for the local council, who's only in the side as a late replacement. But in the second half, Keith Edwards equalised again for Hull. I'm sure many of you will have sat and suffered listening to the cup draw, waiting for your team to come out of the velvet bag at Lancaster Gate. They're agonising moments, and you can see that managers suffer as much as anyone. We were with John Bond of Manchester City and Keith Birkinshaw of Spurs when this evening's draw was made. Number 17, Ipswich Town. Oh. Number 2, against Aston Villa. Oh, what a game. Number 22, That's us. Manchester City, Tottenham. Number 13, no. against Crystal Palace. What do you think about that? <laughs> Number 32, eh? did he do that, do you think? Queen's Park Rangers, <laughs> number 39, against Tottenham Hotspur. Doing battle with Terry Venables. Yes, but it's, uh, I think you can forget about managers, you know, I think there's too much said about what managers are going to do in these sort of games, it's about the players at the end of the day, and uh, we must have a fair chance there. Now, Malcolm said some pretty unkind things about you a fortnight ago on this programme, I mean, have you had any conversations with him since then? <laughs> yeah, I've spoken to him on the phone and he said, uh, if we can't criticise each other and have little chats, he says, and be mates together, he said, what's... The world coming to, I said, lovely. I mean, I, as I said all the way along, that didn't really bother me. If he just said, if Keith here had said the things that he, Malcolm said about me, that would hurt me a lot more than if Malcolm had said. I mean, I, I don't bother. It don't bother me if Malcolm says them. I mean, I've, I've taken them since about 1954, and I <laughs> keep taking them. In those old West Ham days. Well, that's yeah. right. But a game you look forward to, no? Oh, yeah. Yes. Home draw is all you can expect, as I said. Coming back onto his right foot. And clips that one well. Still Boyer beaten in the air. Mackenzie tries the shot. Boyer was in fast. And the referee is given a penalty for an elbow on Boyer. Chance in the ninth, tenth minute of the second half to break the deadlock. Reeves against Fry. 1-0. a bit then. There's Brazil. There's Mayra! Well, there's out on the balance.
the play. Four Mariners, 14th goal of the season. And a marvellous goal it was too. Involving a total of five players, two of them being involved twice. Brazil starting it on the halfway line on the left-hand side. Getting there for the telling pass on the far post for Mariner to put it in. McMahon, lovely through ball from McBride. Young to make across quickly. Lyons is in the centre. And Seattle has turned it into his own net. And with six minutes to go, Everton have taken the lead. Arsenal must have thought they'd survive, but they were caught by the speed of that Everton counter-attack. McMahon stabbed it through. McBride looked for Lyons in the middle. And as Sansom came across trying to clear, he turned the ball into his own net. Everton won. Arsenal nil. Lions. Ross. And Everton full of spirit now. O'Leary. Lions. It's gone in. But he lifted the referee on high. But wait a moment. The linesman can't decide. Well, Everton players congratulating each other. But the linesman has kept his flag raised. The referee has gone across to check with him and has still given the goal. And there's no doubt about that one. Nicky Lyons, the scorer. And Everton are through to the fourth round. In the 90th minute, Everton's persistence paid off. A good build-up, and Lyons stabbed the ball towards goal. Even the desperate challenge on the goal line couldn't keep it out. And although Arsenal claimed that it hadn't crossed the line, the referee, after consulting with his linesman, said it did, and that's the end of the match. And what a finish that was. Ashcroft got the touch, and Tony McAndrew almost got a foot in. Ashcroft, and he's put it there this time, and it's a goal. The ball crossed from Cochrane, and really, while Swansea were thinking they'd escape then, they seemed to pause, the whole defence seemed to freeze, the ball knocked back into the uh, box, and there was Ashcroft. The striker-turned-stopper reverts to his goal-scoring habit, and right against the run of play, and the 42nd minute puts the first division side in front. Shearer to McAndrew, actually hard in, but McAndrew is strong enough. Oh, he found Hodgson so well, can he turn on Rushbury? On to number four, Angus, and it's 2-0, a real blockbuster. McAndrew won the ball, played a beautiful ball through to Hodgson. Hodgson turned, measured the pass to Angus, and the young midfield defender came tearing through to tank it home. And he surely now puts it beyond Swansea's reach. Hodgson battling away up front. He really has been a thorn in this uh, Swansea defence. He's fought for everything. He's shown skill and speed. And there he showed finishing ability. Hodgson. Oh, what a spectacular effort. It is there. Terry Cochran scores one of the most spectacular goals of the season. He goes across the Middlesbrough supporters to celebrate, and no wonder. There was absolutely nothing on there. The ball just bobbing around. It was loose to Cochrane. He speculated, and they accumulate as well. Athley. Phillips. Giles. Swansea so trying to play a lot of these one-twos in the box, and they're not working. Now they've got problems there. Uh, Swansea three against two, Proctor through to Hodgson and it's number five. Ten minutes left and yet another breakaway, split Swansea wide open. Middlesbrough had a spare attacker there and when Proctor got clear he made no mistake with the pass through to Hodgson 
and Hodgson kept his head and found himself eventually with an empty net. Today is to prevent Liverpool from scoring. That is their main priority. And what scenes there would be, of course, if Altingham were to win today. Replay, of course, if it is a draw today, would be it would be at uh, a nice, a beautiful through ball there today. And the goal, an opening goal there from Liverpool. A tremendously worked goal there. From McDermott. The pass inside, a nice one too. And like a flash, the ball was in the Altingham net, giving John Connaughton absolutely no chance. Goal number two, out of the blue. Well, the Altingham defence uh, caught napping, I suppose. Well, the support's there for the Robins, and you can hear it. McDermott in possession, coming forward, thundering forward. Doug Leach going in. And it's a goal. The second one from Kenny Dalglish, and it looks so simple. Liverpool coming away again. Dalglish was, in fact, in an offside position. The referee plays advantage. And Altingham are through. Brought down, and it's a penalty. Jimmy Case, Case having switched over to the left-hand side of the field for the first time this afternoon. Now Gleish plays the ball out to Case, Case going into the byline, pulling it back. A nice ship in, and the goal there, the fourth goal for Liverpool for Ray Kennedy. And that came at the end of some very impressive interpassing indeed, and some play that sums up really what Liverpool are all about. Once the game had settled down, Spurs in the white shirts took control when Brooks' cross was met by Crooks. A measure of Spurs' first half supremacy was this penetrating pass from Hoddle to Galvin, who was playing his first full game of the season. The 1 2 with Crooks and top class finishing that puts his side 2 0 ahead. Tony Curry, another man in form, inspired Rangers for a brief while in the second half. McCreary with a hopeful shot that Danes fails to clear properly. And Curry is on hand with a cross that's perfect for Stainrod. The goal revived Rangers' chances until Archibald, Spurs' top scorer of the season so far, laid on the goal for Glenn Hoddle that gives Spurs a fourth round tie against Hull. Ian Edwards, ITN Sport. He's taking his time coming forward. Right through and knocked away, and Nickel. What a goal! That fairly tore into the net. 33 minutes gone, and Manchester United take the lead. From the corner, the ball chipped into the goal mouth. Knocked away by Foster, but filling the space was Nickel, and first time back past the astonished goalkeeper.
decisive. The ball ricocheted off Stevens, and there was Bertels to knock it in.